Do you ever find yourself searching for something bigger than you? For a community to be a part of? A place founded on truth and love. A place to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Son of God. Welcome to Founded in Truth, where we're more than just a fellowship. We're a family, so welcome home. As you guys know, we just celebrated Passover, and now the next day that we're going to be celebrating on the Hebrew calendar is what? Shavuot, Shavuot right? All right, so today we're going to be talking about the counting of the Omer, what's been called the counting of the Omer, which is what we're going to be doing, or what we should be doing between the time of Passover to Shuk uh, Sukkot, or I'm sorry, Shavuot. So if you're new to this, you might be asking yourself, well, what on earth is an omer, and how do I count it? Well, we're going to be unpacking the basics of, of what that mean, means, but we're mainly going to be focusing on the bigger picture of what I believe this season is building up to, what we're counting towards, and the deeper principles that I believe that God wants to teach us through this season, because how many of you know that you were put on this earth to fulfill a purpose? You were put on this earth to fulfill a purpose. You're not just here to work a job, to come home and watch Netflix and go to bed and wake up and do that over and over again day after day. No, God has a purpose for your life. And I would submit to you that one of the ways that God reveals your purpose is through His holy days. It's through His festivals that He commands us to celebrate. Because how many of you know that God's commandments aren't just these arbitrary religious rituals. His commandments aren't just these religious hoops that he tells us to jump through for fun. No, his word reveals who he is. His word reveals his character. His word reveals who we are and how we relate to him and how we relate to the world and how we reflect his love, how we reflect his character and his image to the world. So we're going to start in Leviticus 23, which is where we get these instructions for this season that we're in, the counting of the Omer. Leviticus 23, starting in verse 15. Oops. And that reads, You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. All right, so count 50 days from Passover to Shavuot is basically what that's saying. And Deuteronomy 16 is a parallel passage. It says, You shall count seven weeks, begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the sanding grain. All right, so what's going on here? Between Passover and Shavuot, there is this period of counting. Basically, we're building up to the next feast day as we count 50 days from the first fruits offering that is uh, presented within the Passover week, and then we count from that offering to the feast of Shavuot. Shavuot, by the way, it means weeks. It's the, the plural of the Hebrew word Shavua, which means weeks. What's the traditional Hebrew greeting that we usually say after the Sabbath? Shavua Tov, right? So Shavuot is plural of that, Shavuot. All right, and that's why in uh, our English translations, you often see this holiday translated as the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. So, this Feast of Shavuot is all about what? It's all about the harvest, the wheat harvest, which is what we're going to be unpacking a little bit later. It's more commonly known by the Greek name Pentecost, which means 50th, which of course stands for the 50th day of the Omer. And this is where it gets really interesting, uh, in my opinion. According to Jewish tradition, it was during Shavuot when God gave the Torah. 
So we recently celebrated Passover, right? And do you all remember God's promise of deliverance that, that we uh, remember every time that we go through the Passover Seder? We go through Exodus chapter 6, and we read about God's promise of deliverance to his people. What was it that God told Moses to tell Israel? Sev several things that he said he was going to promise to do. He said, I will deliver you from Egypt. I will redeem you with an outstretched hand. I will take you to be my people. I will sanctify you, and I will bring you into the land. So part of that promise of deliverance that God gave Israel is that he will take them to be his people. They will be sanctified unto God. This is marriage language, okay? He will take them to be his people. And this promise is fulfilled at Mount Sinai when God gives them the Torah. So that's why uh, traditionally, Shavuot is seen as sort of a, a wedding ceremony. This event at Mount Sinai, it's seen as a wedding ceremony. When Israel says what? They say, I do, I agree to the marriage contract, and God lays out the terms of the covenant, and that ketubah, that marriage contract, is written down in the form of God's law, in the form of the Torah. And all Israel said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. They agree to that marriage proposal. They agree to be God's people. And we agree to it too, don't we? When we receive Yeshua as our Messiah, when we receive God's grace, and when we receive that salvation, and we are set free from our Egypt, from our bondage of sin and death, we say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, don't we? We enter into that process of sanctification. We become sanctified through God's word. And that's what Shavuot is all about. Shavuot is a wedding anniversary. We, it's a time where we remember our marriage vows. It's a time where we celebrate that great commitment that we made with, with the Lord. Shavuot or Pentecost is also the day on which the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples in Acts chapter 2. You read in Acts chapter 2, they were all gathered together in one place. What were they doing? They were celebrating Pentecost or Shavuot. So we'll talk a lot more about that a little bit later and, and how all of this is connected. But first, let's talk a little bit more about counting the Omer. All right, so what is an Omer? An omer is a unit of dry measure equal to one-tenth of an ephah, according to Scripture, which is basically a half a gallon of dry measure. In biblical times, an omer of barley was brought to the temple on each of the 49 days of the omer. So on each of the 49 days, they would physically bring the omer offering and then wave it before God at the temple. The grain stalks would be tied together and then waved before God. So there are several lessons that we can learn from this. One lesson that, that uh, ministers to me personally is that just like the, the grain stalks that they needed to be tied together, God's people represented as wheat, all right, we must be gathered together as one. What happens when you bind a bunch of people together? It gets very uncomfortable, doesn't it? But that's kind of the point, isn't it? That's kind of the point of being bound together as one. That's the point of coming together in community. Community is designed to help us become a kosher wave offering to the Lord. Being in community and dealing with even the difficult parts of community is meant to produce good fruit in our lives. Too many people, they want the joy and they want the benefits and they want the celebration of being part of community, but they reject the difficult parts. When it gets too hard, when they have to deal with people that they don't like very much or they don't get along with very well, they're not very bound with that community. They, they leave or whatever. They don't like the accountability that uh, comes with community, whatever the case may be. Many, too many people, they enjoy the joy and the benefits of community, but they reject the difficult parts. All right, so this is the traditional blessing 
that is said during the count of the Omer. Uh, and this is said every evening. So every evening, as you remember, because biblical days, they begin in the evening. So at the beginning of the biblical day, in evening, you would recite, traditionally, you recite this blessing. It goes, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedeshanu B'mitzvotav Vetsivanu Al Safarat HaOmer. And in English, that's, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the counting of the Omer. So like I said, in ancient days, uh, the Israelites, they'd physically bring the Omer to the temple to wave it before God. Well, there's no temple anymore, right? There's no temple today. So in Judaism, they've developed this liturgy uh, to kind of connect them back to their roots, if you will, to, to make this a, a daily ritual, a daily tradition that they do every day to connect them back to that. And so counting the days and reciting a blessing like this every night is a practical way that we can keep this uh, mitzvah as well. It's a practical way that we can observe this season that we're in. Many families, they also do their own traditions. Many families will do scripture memorization with their kids, for example. They'll uh, make a big calendar with every day of the Omer on it, and they'll have a new Bible passage uh, on every day, and they can recite those every day. They can have their kids memorize them. My family, we actually make a paper chain link with every day of the Omer on it. And then after we do the traditional blessing, every night we'll have our daughter, she'll rip off a new chain link. And it's just, you know, it's just a practical thing to, to kind of get into the spirit of the season. All right, so here are some interesting facts about the counting of the Omer. Uh, one fact is that Psalm 67 is read on the last day of the Omer count because it has 49 Hebrew words that correspond to the 49 days of the count. So that's just a tradition that is developed, and this is actually, I really love this tradition, and uh, I, I want to read this psalm to you because it's, uh, it's really beautiful. But this is what it says. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Selah, that your way may be known upon the earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth, Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So like I said, this is recited on the last day of the Omer, just before we go into Shavuot. And this psalm is all about what? It's all about a harvest. How do we know that? Because it says, the earth has yielded its increase. So it's talking about a harvest. And this harvest is specifically connected to what? What's the harvest connected to? It's connected to all the nations, all the peoples coming to know God and praising Him and worshiping Him. So like I said, this psalm is recited on the 49th day of the Omer right before Shavuot, which is a harvest festival. So when does the psalm say that the earth yields its increase? When God's ways are known upon the earth. The earth will yields its in, yield its increase, which again is connected to all the peoples coming to know God and worshiping God and praising God. The earth yields its increase when God's ways are known upon the earth. We'll unpack that a little bit more later. But first, here are some more interesting facts. Yeshua's post-resurrection appearances all happened between Passover and Shavuot. Another fact is that according to Jewish tradition, the count of the Omer connects our, quote, physical deliverance with our, quote, spiritual deliverance. Passover is completed at Shavuot, in other words. So the counting of the Omer is to remind us that even though we have been set free from Egypt, and Johnny talked a little bit about this earlier uh, in his Torah portion, even though we have been set free from Egypt, from our bondage, we aren't truly free 
until we are walking in God's ways. Even though we've been set free from Egypt, we aren't truly free until we are walking in God's ways. And that's the entire basis of the Torah, isn't it? Which is given at Shavuot, which our Shavuot commemorates that. The entire basis of God's law, His Torah, is freedom. That's the very first of the Ten Commandments. The very first words that God speaks to Israel at the base of Mount Sinai, He says to the entire nation, he says what? I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of bondage. I am the Lord of God who delivered you from Egypt. That's the first of the ten words or the ten commandments. So we have been set free so we can live as free people. And the Torah defines what that looks like. We have been set free so we can live as free people, and the Torah defines what true freedom looks like. So why do I keep emphasizing this? Because our culture, and even people within Christianity, within the church, we have it backwards. Rather than seeing God's ways, His commandments, as freedom, we look at the Torah as bondage. Oh, I don't need this burdensome yoke of God's law. I don't, it doesn't matter what days I rest. Or, or can you believe that I have to care about what I eat or about sexual morality, Christian sexual ethics? That, that's so archaic. That's holding us back from true liberation and freedom. And we need to get out of that mindset of viewing God's Torah as bondage, as holding us back. Because if we don't get out of that mindset, we're never going to impact the world for Messiah's kingdom. Like I said, people cannot truly be free unless they come to know God and walk in His ways. Isn't that what the psalm says? The earth yields its increase when God's ways are known upon the earth. And as our culture, as we gradually do away with God's law, uh, you know, and God's law was our nation is founded on it, right? Our nation is founded on many of the moral principles of God's law. And as we are doing away with these things in our culture, as we're doing away with God's objective standard of truth in our culture, we're becoming enslaved again. Just as Johnny said uh, during the Torah portion section, we're becoming enslaved to our vices. We're becoming enslaved to our sins. We're becoming enslaved to our unstable emotions and our confusion. There's nothing to hold on to anymore. There's no stability. Why? because we've let go of stability. We've walked away from the only objective standard of truth that we had, which is revealed in God's Word, because we can't have objective truth without God. We can't have an objective standard without a standard giver. It's gotten so bad that we don't even know the difference between boys and girls anymore. I mean, in our culture, five years ago, nobody even heard the word transgenderism. But now it's exploded, and we're being, you know, kids are being taught in school that there's no difference between men and women, that there are, that people can be gender fluid, and that people can be biologically one gender, but they're actually the other gender. You have people who deny the obvious fact that human babies inside of the womb are, in fact, human babies. Our culture has created artificial distinctions between humans, just like uh, slave owners used to do with what they viewed as their property, just as slaves. They didn't view them as actual people, so they created artificial distinctions to justify oppressing them. We do the same thing with abortion with children in the womb. It's not a baby, it's a fetus, which, by the way, doesn't even make any sense because fetus is just the Latin word for offspring. Or it's not a baby, it's a clump of cells. 
Well, it's a clump of cells that makes up a baby. You're a clump of cells. That's like saying it's not an elephant, it's a big animal with a long nose and flappy ears. You're describing an elephant. So we make these artificial distinctions, and we're doing this because we've let go. We, we don't understand. We don't get the value of life anymore. We don't understand the objective ontological differences between men and women because we've let go of the objective standard of truth that God has given us through his word. We don't even know these basic things anymore. It's like the people of Nineveh, right? What does it say about the people of Nineveh in Scripture? They don't even know their right hand from their left. So what did God do? He sent a prophet. He sent a prophet to speak the truth, to tell them to repent. And by the way, I'm not knocking the nations here. It's not the nation's fault that the nations are so messed up. They're messed up because the church has failed to be a light. The nations are messed up because we have failed to speak the truth, to make God's ways known upon the earth. What do we expect to happen when the church has thrown out God's ways, when the church has been failing at our calling to be a light to the nations, when the nations have no light to look to, when they have no Jonah to tell them the difference between their right hand and their left hand, it's no wonder they're in darkness. So we need to get back to God's objective standard of truth. We need to get back to his revealed truth in his word. And we need to get serious about being a light to the nations. And that's what this season is all about. It's about getting serious about being a light to the nations. The counting of the Omer teaches us that we are to bring the gospel to the nations and make God's truth known. The counting of the Omer teaches us that we are to bring the gospel to the nations and make God's truth known. Why was the Spirit poured out on Shavuot or Pentecost? It's to teach us that the festival of our deliverance is connected to the harvest festival. We were delivered from Egypt for the purpose of serving Yeshua by bringing in the harvest of the nations. That's what they were doing in Acts chapter 2. They were bringing in the harvest of the nations. When we walk in spirit and truth, we are working together with God and bringing in the harvest. This is what Yeshua said uh, just prior to his ascension. When he was speaking to his uh, uh, disciples, he says that all authority has been given to me, right? And then he gives them what has been called the Great Commission. He says in Matthew 28, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so it says that we are to do what? We are to make disciples of all nations. That doesn't mean, by the way, just having someone recite a prayer after you and then sending them on their way and never talking to them again. No, making disciples entails a relationship. Making disciples entails an investment into people's lives. Making disciples entails having a heart for the lost like Yeshua. Yeshua said that he came to seek and save the lost. Do we have that heart of Yeshua to seek and save the lost? Do we have that heart to reach out to the nations and share with them the love of Messiah, share with them the hope that they have in him? Yeshua goes further in that passage, and he says that they are to teach them, quote, all that I have commanded you. So making disciples entails teaching them all that Yeshua commanded. Well, what is that? What did Yeshua command the disciples? The Sermon on the Mount is a great place to start. And what is the foundation of that Sermon on the Mount? 
After he gives the Beatitudes, he says, I have not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. He said that not one jot or tittle will pass from the Torah until heaven and earth passes away. And he says that his followers are identified by their observance of even the least of the commandments of the Torah. And that his disciples are identified by the fact that their righteousness exceeds even that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So it all comes back to the Torah, the the ongoing authority of the Torah that is in our lives if we're disciples of Yeshua, to uphold that as objective truth. In Acts 1, starting in verse 6, So when they had come together, they asked him, this is uh, the disciples asking Yeshua, Lord, will at this time, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, what a stupid question. I'm done with Israel. I started a new thing. It's called the church. Israel's done away with. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that, does it? No, it says, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, don't worry about it right now. It'll happen, but don't worry about it right now. I have something else for you to focus on right now. Israel hasn't been done away with. Israel's been enlarged with the ingathering of the harvest. Israel has been enlarged with the ingathering of the nations. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we have that same commandment. God delivered us and gave us the Torah and the Holy Spirit so that we may bring in all the nations to worship him and restore his image on the earth. Hasn't this been his plan all along? Hasn't this been God's plan all along? When God called Abraham, what did he say? He said that his offspring would be a blessing to the nations. It's always been about the nations. That's always been Israel's mission, is to be a light to the nations. And as believers who have received Yeshua, our Messiah, we're given that same mission. We've been grafted into that same calling to be a light to the nations. So, what does that look like? How do we walk out this calling practically? Well, I have a couple of things that I want to suggest. The first one is that we are to stand up for truth. What does that mean? Stand up for truth. We are to know the truth. So we are to study the truth. We are to get into the word. We are to learn about what God wants, what our our calling is, what we're supposed to do. We are to live the truth. So practically, what does James say? He says, be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And in context, what, what's that he talking about? He's talking about serving those in the world, serving those who are less fortunate, serving the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Pure and undefiled religion is this, that we visit the widow and the orphan in their affliction and we keep ourselves unstained from the world. So what does that look like practically? What can we do? What are some practical ways that we can live the truth? Think about that. Pray about that. At at Founded in Truth, there are opportunities to serve here. We have a, a foster care ministry that we just launched at Founded in Truth. There are opportunities to get involved there on a practical level. Even if you're not called to to take in a foster child, there are families in this community who have taken on that mission, and there are opportunities that we have to assist them and to help them. 
and it's important. And, and that's something that we can do to be a part of this calling, to be a part of, to, to live out this aspect of the Great Commission. If you have neighbors, people in your community that you can lend a helping hand to, be praying about that, be searching for those opportunities. A third thing is that we need to learn how to articulate the truth, and we need to be willing to discuss and defend the truth. Okay, so I think that most believers are perfectly comfortable with learning the truth, right? Most believers, were perfectly comfortable with consuming all the information, right? And we're comfortable with living the truth. A lot of us are. But we're not very comfortable when it comes to teaching and defending the truth. Why? Well, there are a couple of reasons that I'd like to submit for why that's the case. Number one, I would submit to you, is that be many believers simply aren't equipped with the, uh, the knowledge and, and uh, being able to, to know how to defend the truth, how to answer objections, and so on and so forth. And this is a problem because we're commanded by the disciples to always be prepared to give a defense of the truth. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So the Greek word for defense in that passage, by the way, is apologia. And that is, that from that word, we get our English word apologetics. So what is this passage saying? What's Peter telling us here? He's saying that, we honor Christ, the Lord, as holy in our hearts by engaging in apologetics, by defending the truth, being prepared to make a defense of the truth. That is knowing what we believe, why we believe it, and being able to answer objections. So what does that mean for us practically? That means studying Christian apologetics. That means reading books on the subjects, learning how to answer the deep questions that people struggle with, that we all struggle with. How can God be all good and all loving and there be so much evil and suffering in the world? If God is all good and all loving and all powerful, he loves us and he has the power to stop it, why doesn't he? We need to be able to have answers to those questions. We need to be able to have answers to the questions of biblical reliability. Why do we trust this old book? Why do we believe that this book is God's revelation? Do you have, do you have answers to that when people ask that? Because that's a common question that people have. What about Christian sexual ethics? That's a, that's a big one in our culture right now. How do you minister to someone who struggles with same-sex attraction? How are you able to reach out to them with compassion and love and yet be uncompromising in the truth? How do you answer those difficult questions? Apologetics is, uh, just for me personally, something that the Lord has uh, used to really impact my life. And I'll just share a personal story. When many years ago, um, gosh, probably about 10 years ago now, I re was really struggling with my faith. And I was at a point where I was in a position where I could have potentially walked away, I think. And that's because I had a friend of mine who I really looked up to, and I really respected him. He wasn't like a spiritual mentor or anything, but he was just someone that I really looked up to and respected as a man of God, someone who I thought was incredibly knowledgeable about the Word. And one day, he started getting into atheism. He started listening to a lot of these uh, new atheists 
uh, writers and speakers like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and those, those types of people who are not only atheists, they not only don't think that God exists, but they're very anti-God. They're very anti-religion and think that religion is the worst thing that's ever happened. And so he started getting into these uh, writings and these uh, you know, these uh, speeches from these people, the, the information that these people were putting out. And he started sharing it with me. And then he walked away. He became an atheist. And uh, that really affected me. And I was really struggling with these questions until I started getting on YouTube and watching debates between Christian apologists and these atheists like Christopher Hitchens, and, and I would watch uh, William Lane Craig, he's a Christian apologist, who would do these public debates with all of these guys and utterly mop the floor with them. And that, to me, was really encouraging. And, and this is biblical, by the way. Remember we read in uh, Acts chapter 17 or 18, I believe, when Apollos, uh, he, what does it say? He powerfully refuted the Jews that did not believe in Yeshua, the Messiah and he publicly refuted them, their arguments in public, and that greatly encouraged the other Jewish believers in Messiah. So as I watched these debates, I was really encouraged, and I discovered that, wow, atheism really isn't all that rational. It really isn't all that reasonable, and there are really good reasons intellectually to affirm the Bible as reliable, to affirm the existence of God, to affirm the resurrection of the Messiah Yeshua. And so that was just something that really affected me. And I want to I submit to you guys that there are a lot of people out there that are like that. You know, we often hear in evangelism that we need to meet people at their level. You need to be able to meet people at their level to be able to really minister to them. Well, that also applies to intellectuals. That also applies to people that are philosophers or, or that have these deep questions and these deep struggles, and they need to have that intellectual satisfaction before they can move forward. They need to have those intellectual hurdles removed in order to be able to see the cross clearly so that they can receive the Lord by grace and through faith. Those believers in our community that are struggling with doubt over these deep intellectual questions. We need to be able to minister to them and have mercy on the doubt, doubtful, as Jude writes. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox on that. But um, the next reason, I said there's two reasons why people um, do not, are, are less comfortable defending the truth or standing up for the truth and teaching the truth. The second reason I would submit to you guys is because many believers do not like confrontation. We don't like to offend people. We're happy just saying, okay, you do your thing and I'll do mine. I'll stay out of your way. You stay out of my way. And we don't like to impose our views on others, right? A lot of us don't just like to be left alone. And that might be very polite, but it isn't necessarily very biblical because we're supposed to be sharing our truth, our, our, the truth. We're supposed to be sharing the word of God. We're supposed to be preaching the word. And again, what does the psalm say? The earth will not yield its increase until God's ways are known upon the earth. And if we aren't teaching God's ways, how will they be known upon the earth? That obviously doesn't mean we are to be a jerk to people. We are to speak the truth in love. But we have to be okay with the fact that speaking the truth will be offensive to some people. Speaking the truth will be offensive to some people. If I had cancer, I'd want my do uh, doctor to tell me that I had cancer, even though that would be very offensive to me. It would be very offensive to me to find out that I had cancer, but I would want to know because I would want the opportunity to make choices to remedy that, to, to be able to know what I have to do in order to get rid of the cancer and to hopefully survive that. 
This world has cancer. We need to be able to not be afraid to stand up for what's right, not be afraid to be uncompromising when it comes to the truth. You know, I brought up the transgender community earlier, and this is just a community that is really been heavy on my heart the last couple of years. I've spent um, hours weeping for this community and prayer and just, uh, just praying for God to touch the hearts of these people that uh, are going through these struggles of, imagine how difficult that must be to struggle with your identity as a man or a woman, to have gender dysphoria or gender confusion. And so my heart really goes out to them, and, and especially because in our culture recently, they're just being abandoned to their delusions. And this is a problem because if you look at statistics and you look at the suicide rates, they are, in the transgender community, the suicide rates are the same, if not higher, for those after they transition, quote unquote, to a new gender, it's the same, if not higher, than it was before they transi transitioned. So what does that tell us? What does that tell us about the world's solution to this problem? It doesn't work. Abandoning people to their delusions doesn't work. Can we really claim to love these people if we aren't willing to tell them the truth? If love seeks the highest good for another, this is what I believe Love entails that we seek the highest good for another. We must be willing to tell the truth. We must be willing to stand firm on the truth so that people can be delivered. Okay, so what does that look like practically? Well, whatever platform God has given you, I want to encourage you guys to use that platform for his glory if he's given you influence with your friends or your co-workers, be prepared to speak the truth in love to them. If you have kids, you know, that you have that platform with your kids to be able to stand firm on the truth, to teach them the truth, to disciple your children. That's what the Shema says in Deuteronomy 6, right? We are to teach the, our kids the commandments, to raise them up in the Lord's ways. If you're on social media, that's a platform that you can use. You know, social media is, I know that a lot of people complain about how terrible social media is, but in reality, social media is neither good nor evil. It's a tool. It's simply a tool, and it depends on how you use it. A lot of people use it for evil. Why aren't we using it for good? Why aren't we using it to proclaim the truth of God, to, to post edifying messages, to post links to sermons or articles or whatever, to, to have conversations, to engage the, the people and, and answer their questions, show them the love of Messiah? I can't tell you how many times people have reached out to me to express how something that I've posted on social media has impacted them. And, and I really want to emphasize that because I think a lot of people, they get this impression that, oh, nobody changes their mind by something that they see on social media. Or nobody changes their mind because of an argument on Facebook. And, you know, maybe we ought to consider that the reason people don't change our mind, their mind is because we aren't very good at being persuasive. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's not social media. Maybe we should stop blaming other people for their lack of comprehension or their inability. Maybe we should focus on ourselves and are we being persuasive? Are we using this tool effectively for God's kingdom? All right, the second thing that we got to do is to be in community. That means we are to be humble and accountable to others. We are to not be afraid to hold others accountable, and we are to be committed. Be committed to the body of Messiah. So why is community necessary? Why do I include community? Well, John 13, 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, 
if you have love for one another? How will all people, if, we're, if this is all about the Great Commission, if this is all about bringing in the harvest of the nations so that the earth may yield its increase, well, how will those people know that we are Yeshua's disciples? It says right there, if we have love for one another. And 1 John 4.20 says, If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he ha- has seen, cannot love God, Whom he has not seen. How can we know that we love our brothers? Because remember, love is required. Loving each other is required for the world to know that we are his disciples. Well, how can we know that we love our brothers if we aren't in fellowship with them? And how can we know that we truly love God if we don't know whether or not we truly love our brothers? Because it says, anyone who hates his brother cannot love God. It's easy to say that you love someone when you aren't in community with them. You know that your love is real. You know that you actually have love for each other when it's been tested. And many, uh, one of the biggest ways that God tests our love for each other is in community, is in relationships with each other. How many of you ever li- lived with a roommate? Right? Okay, so probably a friend that you've had beforehand. I know that I've had uh, friends that I've moved in with. And then before we move in with each other, we're thinking about how awesome it's going to be and like, yeah, it's just going to be great, you know, and party all the time. And then when we move in with each other and they never do the dishes, they never take care of the house, it's always a big mess, and we get on each other's nerves all the time. And then it's not really that great of an idea anymore after that, is it? And that, but, you know, that's how our love is tested. That is how our love, is, we know our love is real, as if we are able to be committed even in the difficulties. So community is absolutely essential to living a life led by spirit and truth. We need each other. Like I said earlier, community is what produces fruit in our lives. In fact, there's no biblical framework for living your life isolated from other believers. In Proverbs 18, 1 through 2, it says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. It's very easy to be foolish. It's very easy to rage out against sound judgment when you have no faith community to hold you accountable and to give you a balanced perspective. Being accountable means being honest and and accepting responsibility for areas that you're deficient in. It also means admitting mistakes, which is hard, but it's good to admit mistakes. It's good to acknowledge our weaknesses so that we can grow. For instance, one of the areas or one of the practical ways that God helps us grow in this area is by telling us to confess our sins to one another. In James 5, 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. A lot of us don't like to follow this commandment. Many of us, because of our insecurity because we're just guarded because we've been hurt by people in the past we don't like to be vulnerable and so we shut the door to god bringing healing in our lives we shut the door to god producing fruit in our lives we shut the door to god speaking to us through those other people that he puts in our lives We need to be willing to be held accountable. We need to be willing to be vulnerable. I understand that it can be uncomfortable. I understand that it can be scary. But we need to get over our our pride and our fear in this area. I challenge you guys. You know, we're, we're part of this community. I challenge you to ask someone if they see something in your life. Say, man, be honest with me. Is there anything in my life that I'm deficient in? Is there anything in my life that I'm, I'm a jerk about? Tell me. I want to learn. I want to grow. I trust you. 
God put you in my life for a reason. I'm almost done. The, the third reason, or the third um, way that we bring in the harvest I want to submit to you is to be led by the Spirit. That means to be in continual prayer with the Father. That means to acknowledge God in all your ways and to be willing to obey when the Spirit gives you direction. So I'll give you an example. Uh, at my old church in St. Louis, Missouri, we had an evangelism team. And basically what we would do is we would print out these gospel tracts and we would go to the mall or we would go downtown or wherever and wherever people were. And then we would go and we'd hand out these gospel tracts and we would get in conversations with people and we would pray for people and we would share the gospel with people. And when I, when I would be part of this team and we would go out and we would do this, I didn't talk to every single person that walked by. When I was a part of these evangelism nights, I would be in continual prayer. I would be walking and I would be praying and I'd be praying for people as I'd be walking and I would ask God, I'd be, God, highlight someone to me. Highlight someone to me that you want me to talk to. And it wouldn't be every person. It would be a few people usually. But when I would do that, that would turn into a fruitful discussion. It would turn into a fruitful uh, conversation with that person where uh, we were able to talk about the gospel, where the truth was able to be preached. I was able to minister to those people. I was able to pray for those people. And open yourself up to those opportunities. Be led by the Spirit. Pray. Um, a, a gentleman that actually goes to this church, he actually shared a really moving story with me recently where he was driving and he saw someone just kind of hanging out on the bridge and he drove by like a, the bridge that he was driving on and he just kind of thought it was strange and he kind of had just sort of a, he felt moved about it. And he didn't know why, but he just kind of felt like he needed to go back and he needed to talk to that person for some reason. And he went and he came back and he went out of his way to uh, park his car and to ask that person, hey, are you okay? Do you need any help? Turns out that the guy was thinking about committing suicide. That he was considering jumping off the bridge or, or doing something like that. And so this gentleman, he had the opportunity to pray with that person and to minister to them. And obviously, um, it was a good ending to that story. You know, he didn't do it. But I share that to say this, that we need to open ourselves up to those opportunities. We need to always be in continual prayer. We need to always be asking the Lord, God, lead me, direct me. Who do you want me to talk to? What can I do? And ultimately, I believe that comes back to knowing what God's word says because God gave us his spirit to lead us into all truth and his word is truth. So we need to always be in the word and we need to have those, that framework within which we allow that spirit to move us and to guide us. Worship team, if you guys would like to come up again. I mentioned earlier um, how Shavuot is seen as a wedding ceremony between God and his people. It's celebrated as a wedding anniversary when, when God proposed to his people. And I believe that this season reminds us that at the end of time, there will be a wedding ceremony. At the end of time, there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. And this great commission is our way of giving God's marriage proposal, if you will. How many of you have ever seen a fiddler on the roof? Okay, I'm sure all of you have seen it. Well, remember Yinta, right? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. So she was the matchmaker in the community. Well, we are God's matchmakers. We're to go out and, and there's a wedding coming and 
We're to reach out to people and to say, God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. God wants to deliver you from your slavery. He wants to sanctify you. He wants to take you to be his special people. Ruth is also traditionally read on Shavuot, and uh, Ruth is also all about a marriage, right? It's all about the kinsman redeemer redeeming her. She was needy. She was alone. And then Boaz, he redeemed her, and he married her. This world out there is broken and alone. it's It's a Nineveh out there. They're lost and confused. They don't know their right hand from their left. And God is sending us out into the world so that we can minister to them, so that we can bring them into a community of love with Yeshua the Messiah and the Father. If you guys want to pray with me real quick. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your deliverance. We thank you, God, that you love the nations. Your plan all along, God, was to use your people to bless the nations. And Father, we are just so grateful. We're just so humbled that we get to be part of that. God, that we get to be part of your love story. Father, I ask that you would empower your people to, with your Holy Spirit, God, that you would guide them, that you would direct them, that you would open up doors for them, God, to minister to people, to share the love that they have with those around them. Lord, we just pray that the nations would come to praise you, that the earth would yield its increase, God. The nations would come to praise you, Father, that they would worship you, that your name would be sanctified on this earth, that your image would be restored on this earth through your people. God, we love you so much. We bless you and we thank you in your son Yeshua's name. Amen. Hello? Oh, oh still on. I just wanted to bless you guys if, if that was all right. Yevarechacha Adonai Vaishmarecha, Yaer Adonai Panavalecha Vihunecha, Yisa Adonai Panavalecha Visim Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant you his peace. Bashim Yeshua Hamashiach, Sarha Shalom, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. May you guys be blessed. Amen. Shalom. I'm Matthew Vandrells, and I hope you enjoyed this message. Founded in Truth exists to cultivate a fellowship of image bearers that live the redeemed life only Yeshua can give. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, we would love to hear from you. Send us an email through the contact form on our website and tell us how God has used this ministry to edify your faith and relationship with Him. If you'd like to see more messages like this one, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here. If you'd like to donate to this ministry and be a part of what God is doing through it, you can donate through our online giving portal here. We thank you for your continued support, and we look forward to next time. Shalom.